Ever wonder how we know atoms even exist? I mean, we can't see them, right? Right. They're way too small. So how do we know they're really there? Well, it turns out there's this really cool phenomenon called Brownian motion that actually helps us prove atoms exist. Brownian motion. Yeah, you know that kind of like jiggling motion you see when tiny particles are suspended in a fluid? Oh, yeah, like when you look at pollen grains in water under a microscope. Exactly. That's Brownian motion. And for a long time, it was a real mystery to scientists. Yeah, because like, why are those particles always moving? Shouldn't they just settle down eventually? Well, according to the physics of the time, they should have. Classical thermodynamics just couldn't explain this constant jiggling. So that's where Einstein comes in. Yep. Einstein was like, hold on a minute. What if we're thinking about this all wrong? <laughs> okay, I'm intrigued. He had this radical idea that maybe those tiny particles are constantly being bombarded by e even tinier particles that we can't see the molecules of the fluid itself. So like a microscopic mosh pit. Pretty much. Every time one of these molecules bumps into a larger particle, it sends it off in a random direction. And because these collisions are happening all the time and from all sides, the particle just keeps jiggling around. Precisely. And that was Einstein's big aha moment. He realized that the seemingly random jiggling Brownian motion was actually direct evidence for the existence of molecules and atoms. Whoa. Ah. So by watching these tiny particles dance around you, you can actually prove the existence of things you can't even see. Exactly. And Einstein didn't stop there. He went on to develop a mathematical framework to describe this motion. Okay, so he didn't just say, hey, look, those particles are moving, so atoms must exist. He actually, like, did the math to prove it. Oh, yeah, he was all about the math. He wanted to show that if his theory was right, you could actually predict the behavior of these particles based on the properties of the fluid, like its temperature and viscosity. So how did you do that? Like, how do you even begin to measure something as chaotic as a drunken walk, as he called it? Well, he started by focusing on something called the mean squared displacement. Mean squared what now? Basically, it's a way to measure how far a particle wanders from its starting point over time. Okay, I'm falling so far. And Einstein derived the super elegant formula that connects this displacement to the properties of the fluid and to time. Give me the SparkNotes version of that formula, please. It essentially says that the displacement of a particle is proportional to the square root of time. So the longer you watch a particle, the farther it's likely to have strayed from where it started. Oh, so it's not about how fast the particle is moving, but about how far it ends up from its starting point because of all those random bumps. You got it. And here's another key piece of this formula. It includes something called the diffusion coefficient. Okay. I'm going to need a little help with that one, too. <laughs> What's the diffusion coefficient? It's basically a measure of how easily a substance spreads out in a fluid. Like if you drop a bit of dye in water, it'll spread out faster in warm water than in cold water. So, yeah, that makes sense. So the diffusion coefficient captures that. It describes how the properties of the fluid affect the motion of the particles within it. Okay, so Einstein basically connected this macroscopic observable property, the rate of diffusion, to the microscopic world of molecules causing the jiggling. Exactly. It was a brilliant insight that linked the visible to the invisible. I'm starting to see how this all fits together, but we still haven't talked about how he figured out the size of atoms, right? We're getting there. Yeah. Remember Avadadra's number? Vaguely. It's like that really big number that tells you how many atoms are in a mole of substance. Yeah, like 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd power. A number so big, it's hard to even imagine. Well, Einstein figured out that his formula for the mean square displacement could actually be used to calculate Avogadro's number. Wait, hold on. You're saying you can learn about something as fundamental as the number of atoms in a mole just by watching tiny particles jiggle around. That's the power of Einstein's work. Mm. He connected these seemingly unrelated concepts in a way that no one had ever done before. So how did he actually propose doing this experimentally? What would that experiment look like? Well, it involved a microscope, a stopwatch, and a whole lot of patience. You'd basically observe the motion of these tiny suspended particles under a microscope. So like literally just watch them jiggle around. Yep. But the key is to carefully track their positions over time. Like take snapshots at regular intervals and measure how far they've moved. And then you plug those measurements into Einstein's formula. Exactly. You use the measured mean squared displacement along with the temperature and viscosity of the fluid and boom you can calculate Avogadro's number. It's kind of mind-blowing that you can figure out something so fundamental just by watching tiny particles move around. It really is. And the craziest part is that Einstein's theory was actually put to the test just a few years after he published it. Oh, really? 
Someone actually tried to do this experiment. Yeah, a French physicist named Jean Perrin did a whole series of experiments to verify Einstein's predictions. So was Einstein right? Did the experiments back him up? They did. Perrin's experiments matched up beautifully with Einstein's calculations. So that was it. Case closed, atoms exist. Pretty much, Perrin's work provided such strong evidence for the existence of atoms that it pretty much settled the debate. Wow, what a victory for Einstein and for science in general. It was a huge turning point in our understanding of the universe. It's like we suddenly had this new window into the microscopic world. It makes me think about all those classic images of atoms, like those little balls with electrons orbiting around them. Exactly. Those models were based on the insights gained from studying Brownian motion. So what did this new understanding of Brownian motion lead to? Like, how did it shape modern science? Oh, man, it had a ripple effect across so many fields. Okay, give me some examples. Well, for starters, it laid the foundation for statistical mechanics. Statistical what now? It's a branch of physics that deals with the behavior of systems with like a huge number of particles. So instead of trying to track the motion of every single atom, you look at their overall behavior as a group. Exactly. It's like trying to understand traffic patterns. You don't need to know where every single car is going. You just need to know the general flow. That makes sense. So statistical mechanics is basically crowd control for atoms. Yeah, kind of. And it's been super helpful in understanding all sorts of complex phenomena, like how heat flows or how gases and liquids behave. It's amazing to think that this all started with watching tiny particles jiggle around. It just shows that even the seemingly mundane can hold the key to unlocking incredible scientific discoveries. So what about other fields? Where else has Brownian motion made an impact? Well, take chemistry, for example. Brownian motion plays a crucial role in understanding chemical reactions. Okay, I'm listening. So for a chemical reaction to occur, molecules need to bump into each other, right? Yeah, that cuts. Well, the random motion of those molecules driven by Brownian motion is what determines how often they collide. So the more they bump into each other, the faster the reaction goes. <laughs> yeah, it. it's like a microscopic dance floor. The more bumping and grinding, the faster the chemistry happens. Okay, that's a pretty good analogy. Mm -hmm. And what about biology? How does Brownian motion play into living things? It's super important for understanding how cells work. Really? Yeah. Think about how nutrients and waste products move across cell membranes. Okay. Well, a lot of that movement is driven by Brownian motion. Those tiny particles are constantly jiggling and bumping into each other, helping to transport stuff around inside the cell. So it's like a microscopic delivery service powered by randomness. Exactly. And it's not just about transport. Brownian motion also plays a role in things like cell signaling and even DNA replication. Wow. So this seemingly random jiggling is actually essential for life itself? It's a fundamental part of how things work at the molecular level. This is incredible. I had no idea. Brownian motion was so important. I mean, it's everywhere. It really is. And we're still discovering new ways to apply this knowledge, like in designing new materials or developing targeted drug delivery systems. It's amazing how something that seems so simple can have such far-reaching consequences. That's the beauty of science. You never know where a simple observation might lead you. It's really pretty mind-blowing when you think about it. It is. It's like we're surrounded by this invisible world of constant motion. And it all ties back to that idea you mentioned earlier about chaos underlying the predictable world. Right. Like, even though things might seem pretty stable and orderly at our level, if you zoom in far enough, it's just a whirlwind of random motion. Yeah. It's like if every atom in my body is moving randomly, how am I even able to sit here and talk to you? Well, that's where the power of large numbers comes in. Okay. Explain that to me. So when you have trillions upon trillions of atoms all jiggling around randomly. Their individual motions kind of average out. So it's like flipping a coin a million times. Exactly. Each individual flip is random, but overall you're going to end up with pretty close to 50% heads and 50% tails. So the law of averages smooths out the chaos at the microscopic level. Exactly. But that doesn't mean randomness is irrelevant. It's still there influencing all sorts of things like how molecules spread out or even how stars evolve. So it's this delicate dance between order and chaos that shapes the universe as we know it. I like that. A delicate dance. It's a pretty profound thought. It really is. Yeah. And it makes you appreciate the complexity of even the simplest things. Right. Like take a glass of water. It seems so still and clear. But at the molecular level, it's pure chaos. Water molecules constantly bouncing off each other. It's like one of those time-lapse videos of a busy city. All those individual people rushing around. But when you zoom out, it looks like a smooth flow of movement. That's a great analogy. And that's what's so cool about Einstein's work on Brownian motion. 
It gave us a way to see that hidden world, the randomness that drives the predictable world. I think I'll never look at a glass of water the same way again. I hope so. Yeah. It's a good reminder that there's always more to discover, even in the most ordinary things. Well, this has been an incredible deep dive, I've got to say. Who knew that watching tiny particles jiggle could lead to such mind-blowing insights? It's a testament to Einstein's genius and to the power of scientific curiosity. Absolutely. From proving the existence of atoms to understanding how they behave. Einstein's work on Brownian motion really revolutionized our understanding of the universe. And it's still shaping scientific discovery today in fields like nanotechnology, medicine, and beyond. So to everyone listening, keep asking questions, keep exploring, and keep that sense of wonder alive. Because who knows what other amazing secrets the universe has waiting to be uncovered. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the world of Brownian motion. Until next time.